Today's show is sponsored by Indie Film Hustle's Filmmaker Process. We provide filmmakers with professional services to get their films or series funded, finished, and distributed. For more information, go to filmmakerprocess.com. The, the coming back up. So you, you get Boondocks back from from um the man who shall not be named um Voldemort let's call him Voldemort uh <laughs> Voldestein 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 um so you get your your script back eventually and then you you get it released so tell the story of how it actually gets made oh man yeah yeah now you're hitting on some secrets that I've kept for 25 years dude <laughs> okay so, uh, exclusive I- shit I shouldn't say number two <laughs> <laughs> Got the documentary out of me. Now you're gonna get some weird. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the the. <laughs> all right. I'm not gonna give you all of it, but I'll give you a couple of. Years. As much as dude, as much or as little as you want, brother. When we came to blows, I mean, me and Harvey just disagreed on things, and he's like, "All right, that's it. Uh, you're in turnaround now. You know what it is." Um, but uh, for the for the for the viewers out there that don't, that means that if, if Harvey has say bought your script three hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars, done a uh, uh, paid a couple of your producers, and, uh, done maybe one location scout, say he's in it a million bucks. What turnaround is, is that you put it like a yard sale, you put it back out uh, for sale. You know this script that was highly uh, desirable by the in- industry, uh, and you try to recoup some of your money. Uh, about the most anyone gets in a uh, turnaround situation is 50%, half their investment. Mm -hmm. Uh, So Harvey puts it in turnaround. Lo and behold, this other company wants to do it, a new new company, a new guy, and uh, he charges 100% in a turnaround situation. Uh, I was friends at the time uh, with a guy named Arnold Rifkin, who was the president of William Morris and a friend. I had to tell you about going up to his house one day. It was unbelievable. <laughs> I'm sure it was. <laughs> about a young man's ego soar. And I was like, this guy had guard dogs that responded to German. It was amazing. <laughs> it was like True Lies. It was like the beginning. It was like the opening of True Lies. Got it. <laughs> right. So he was like, you know, I really looked up to Arnold. And um, he gets super pissed. You know, like Harvey Weinstein will not be treating our clients like this. So he puts red, his whole company on red alert. Boondock Saints gets made right now find somebody to pay the 100% or we chop Harvey down in some way, but this movie gets made and this young writer director gets out there. Wow. Because when you're put in turnaround, by the way, that's death. You're, you're somebody's, you I am now the black sheep of Miramax. No one wants to touch me. Uh, you know, certain things are already known about me in the industry. The sort of uh, yay Troy thing is going downhill at this point. And this couldn't have happened at a worse time. It's in the first real tragedy that uh, I absorbed in the business, right? So uh, on comes of one of my favorite human beings in the world, Cassie and Elvis, who was uh, the president of independent film financing over there at mm-hmm. William Moore. Uh, he's actually Harry <laughs> Elvis's right. uh, brother mm-hmm. from Men in Tights. And- <laughs> well, Princess, I mean, Princess Bride saw, but well, but you, yeah. you chose Men in Tights. That's fine. All right. <laughs> say about you i mean carrie carrie's done i mean i mean uh, he's done a a couple things i'm just saying yeah yeah yeah. so uh cassian was he's about the greatest guy in the world Mm -hmm. so so he finds you know this uh, company come in they're they're gonna pay the hundred percent a turnaround situation and uh it's the first time rifkin said you know i'm all my years in this business i've never seen this happen and clearly harvey does not want this movie being made for obvious reasons Mm -hmm. you know he doesn't want it becoming successful when you know, he's writing, writing you off as a mistake and trying to make everyone forget that this even happened. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, cut to get the thing made. I get a bottle of champagne and a note from Harvey on the day, first day of principal, which I completely mistake as uh, genuine. Uh, but, but it was just a gangster tactic. It was a, to screw <laughs> was, you up, to screw you up on your day one. Yeah, that's all it was. Yeah, it was like the gangster walking you to say, hey, you're doing a good job. We're like him over Sam. We're like, yeah. <laughs> Here's a fish. <laughs> uh, here's a fish paper. Don't read into it. Don't read into it. So I get the, you know, get the movie made, and yeah, you know, we're going to spare you some of the other stories, but uh, there was, there was, there was some quite obvious things that happened once I tried to get my little movie out there, mm-hmm. where roadblocks were, you know, inexplicably being thrown up in front of this film, and I had people from this industry calling me. 
telling me that they had been straight up intimidated either by him personally or people wow. representatives for his, from his company, wow. you know? And so it was this campaign to so... then when the movie got made to end it, to end it and have no one see it. But strangely enough though, and here's the fucked up part of this. Mm-hmm. He didn't have, he wasn't able to st- when you, you make a movie like that, that the kids are going to find it's, it's going to happen no mm-hmm. matter what. The thing that really screwed us at the time was a whole nother deal. It was well, two weeks before we were kind of, we were having our screenings for the industry, and that's where you take your little movie. You go to the big lots, Sony, Paramount, and yeah. Fox. You, it, we went to all of them, and you have screenings for all them and their buyers, and all buyers from all, all over the place. And so this, you got packed. I was, we were having packed screenings, three, four hundred people. Uh, almost no one was leaving, which always happens mm-hmm. in these types of screens. But you're basically asking somebody, you know, buy my film and distribute it through your your engine, your network. And uh, Columbine happened. And uh, I don't I don't know if you remember right uh, the fuck there like it was on cue. Uh, We're having screenings that are off the charts. And people are loving it. And then nobody coming forward. We were reading the kind of writing in the sand. Finally, this one, this one buyer comes up to us and says, "You know, congratulate." He's highly complimented. Congratulations, you made a great movie. And he, very, very uh, nice about it. He said, you, "You've been, you've been blacklisted from U.S. screens. Nobody is going to theatrically release this movie. So, you got to uh, put it out." Yeah. And that was just like dun dun dun. You know, we were all. Talk about trying to find your answer in the bottom of a beer glass. We just, everybody, hard, how hard we had worked and this thing that happened, nothing to do with us. But all the, all the touchstones in it, and people in trench coats did this. I, I, two oh, guys, oh, like, oh, uh, it, was, no. it, was two, it was two young men uh, that did the violence. I had two young men. You know, uh, and uh, it was just all the parallels were ridiculous. And it was exactly what they were stopping production on and pulling out of theaters right there. And Clinton landed here and had a whole talk with the industry, and they, they reacted that way. You just stop production on anything with violence in it right now, especially the youth, youthful violence, pull anything with violence out of theaters. They even started in with video games. And I was right there with my little film going, please help me, you know? And we just got screwed. But, fun story, Boondock was about to touch the public for the first time, Mm -hmm. right? And I was in the darkest depression ever because I'm like, it doesn't matter now. No theatrical release. There's no way this film's going to be successful. Mm -hmm. So, up, I meet this guy, Dean Wilson, who remained one of my dearest friends and contacts in this business until his death uh, a couple years ago. Dean was the CFO of Blockbuster. And they had 7,500 stores. They, that was the, during the biggest. They, they were huge. Mm-hmm. They, they were home video for every studio. Mm-hmm. And they had a lot of power. So I take him down. It was like actually it was me and Flannery. <laughs> you know? And a couple, of, I think maybe even Norm was there. We take him down to Photochem and arrange a screening for him to see the film. I remember because I'd already seen it a million times. I fell asleep in the only thing that I had bought with my newfound riches, which was the 68 Chevelle fire (laughs) engine red with tinted windows, badass car. (laughs) I get a knock on the window and here's this excited guy, Dean Wilson. Right. And uh, he's like, oh, my God, that's great. He goes, we're going to we're going to release this and make a deal uh, for you to to be a blockbuster exclusive. I didn't know what that was at the time, but what they were doing. What they were doing was taking smaller films that they felt should have been theatrical released or that they saw some thought would really touch their their public uh, and release them in in blockbuster stores like they were big films. Instead of two copies per store, there was 60 or 120, depending on the size of the store. So Boondock was released on video as if it was some big theatrical success. And I remember walking through my local blockbuster store and just seeing shelves and shelves of Boondock Saints, you know, at that time, um, videotapes. It was VHS at first, mm-hmm. you know, and this was right during the, the crossover of DVD was beginning. So I was like, all right, make the deal. So they made the deal, right? And uh, come to find out later on 
that it was Blockbuster's highest grossing straight to video hit in their history. Now, something I always kidded Dean about was he had the Blockbuster had the or he had the opportunity to buy the home video rights for one hundred and fifty grand slightly after he saw how well it was doing. It made some ridiculous amount in six months, like Mm -hmm. like 12 million bucks. You mean as a as a part as part of the deal? And it's like it was it was we're going to take a a video. The deal was we're going to do an exclusive blockbuster video window. We'll pay you this much and share this much of the profits with you. And they were like, all right, you want the, uh, vi- the all the video rights too, so you can sell all VH, not just rental deal, but like you can sell uh, all, right. all the VHS and DVDs that are going to come out because of this for 150 grand. If he had taken that deal, I remember just lighting into him once when we were at dinner. <laughs> he took me to dinner to meet Charlie Icon. It was <laughs> the best. It was the best. Mm-hmm. And I, I was like, you guys, you guys had the opportunity to buy that for 150 grand. And in front of Charlie Icon, I went, you would have made $150 million if you had done that. And the, by the way, by that time, the numbers were in. So that wow. wasn't a joke. And Dean was like, thanks. <laughs> I think you know me, Charlie Icon, you see, you're the most embarrassing goddamn thing I've ever done. It's, like, it's kind of like, it's like when, it's nobody, more like, like. Nobody would have seen it if it wasn't for this guy. So I like right. owed him everything. Right. It's kind of like when Fox uh, gave Lucas the uh, sequel rights and the merchandising rights for Star Wars. Yeah. S- I sim- can't tell you how many times people have compared <laughs> me to George Lucas there, but let me show you how not. Uh, <laughs> that's the George Lucas was smart. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, just angry. At one point, I went, I want the merchandising rights. And they were like, you're making a $6 million film. Who do you think is going to buy a T-shirt? So <laughs> it was the easiest thing in the world to shut me up, to give me the merchandising rights. And that ended up being saving my bacon in a lot of ways. Yeah. So so the movie comes out. It's a huge success. Um, everybody sees it because it's – and for people who don't understand Blockbuster in 2001, 2002, 2003, in that world, they were at the height of their of their – it was 2000. It was released 2000. in 2000, the Blockbuster. And you're right. It became a huge hit. Huge. And apparent, apparently no one noticed except the people of the Blockbuster and the fans. When a, a movie does that kind of business, you know, just think about a company owing on 10 other movies that maybe did not do, mm-hmm. didn't even recoup. There's all kinds of problems that can happen. And... We uh, got into this area where, you know, from from the industry, what we were being told was it's not a success. You know, nothing. You got nothing. We got a, yeah, I got a contract says I'm owed money here. So, no, it didn't do well. And I, I remember going to a gas station one day and seeing my first kid with the fucking tattoos for my movie. Wow. on. And I just, you know, I'm looking, I didn't say anything to him. And I start noticing in public, you know, I'm at bars and suddenly... People will pop off lines from my movie while they're screwing around with each other at a pool table. So it was hard for me to believe that it wasn't doing well when I was seeing it in my own life just randomly, you know? So we ended up, if we cut two years later, had a big lawsuit, settled that all out, got right. the secret rights and went forward with that, which we, we, may have to, we may have to piece this into two interviews, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Too much out of me. But yeah, it became extremely successful. But but so in other words, Hollywood accounting took over is what you're saying. In a lot of ways. I mean, there's a lot I can't say because it's fair enough. Fair enough. But uh, yeah, you know, the the old adage of uh, you must have heard it, too. You know, you you get fucked on your first one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're never going to make money on your first one. That's just just. It's it's the sequel. That's where the money Uh, is. Yeah. 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 And that. Yeah. Yeah. That happened, too. And 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 to be fair, George, as well. On the first one, financially didn't do well. On the movie, the, the merchandise he did okay, but the yeah. um, the movie didn't do well. But Empire, he that's where he started really yeah. making no. his money. So same thing. So yeah. you're so you go through this process. The movie gets out, you get the rights back, and now you own and control the sequel rights to Boondock, right? At this point, well, you got the rights back at least. Yeah, 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 yeah. We we uh, got the right because you know the 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 sequel rights were wrapped into this company and this lawsuit we were in. So once it, that was settled, we got our sequel rights and we were able to do uh, two. And within 48 hours of the conclusion of that, uh, of those legal troubles, we had a deal for two on the table with Sony. 
and and then and then that went. I remember reading because I kept I kept I followed you over the years. I was like, what happened to Bo- what happened to Troy? What happened to Boot? So I'd always like read whatever was out and some some things. And when the sequel came out, I was reading like how did he do? What's going on? And from what I understood, and please correct me if I'm wrong, this, the merchandising rights that that's it's like George says, the money's in the launch box is idiots. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, did well, uh-huh. uh, and it still is, you know. But the the it's the you know with with the with the sequel, yeah, that that's made a metric ton of money and done very very well and continues to, you know, cult a cult, cult classic is about the coolest two words in film, and uh, you know I wasn't the first to say that. There was a whole bunch of other people that did, and that's what I that's what I've done. And I'm extremely grateful to all those long-suffering fans. Because, I mean, if you think about it, they're, they're going to be waiting 10 years between one and two and another 10 between two and three. You know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> it sucks, but, you know. It's, it's, you're like the Kubrick of, of, indie, of indie films. Like, he does one movie every 10 years. It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. It's, I'm, I'm like Lucas and Kubrick, just not half as talented or wealthy. <laughs> Exactly. It's just like them, but completely different. (laughs) To watch the rest of this interview, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com.